All right, I'm very pleased to be with you to speak uh, about the evolution of the imagination. And I want to explore uh, the role of mythopoetic cognition. And I think um, people understand the idea that human beings are story-making creatures uh, and image-making creatures. And I think it's very common for people to understand that the imagination is available to many of us, if not all of us. Uh, but I'm going to be making sort of a stronger pitch for the imagination as a kind of cognitive operating system. And that we've grasped it piecemeal and understood bits and pieces of it, but we need to sort of move it to the front and center of consciousness and cognition. I'll just give you a quick uh, tour of what I've been up to for the last 10 years or so. I've been writing a series of books that are roughly, <coughs> you know, built around the idea of the imagination. And about 10 years ago, I wrote a book called On Monsters, uh, An Unnatural History of Our Worst Fears. And the, the topic of that is fairly self-explanatory. Um, and then I wrote this book, The Evolution of Imagination. Some of the ideas that I'm going to be talking with you today about uh, come out of that text. Uh, but I've, I'm also sort of steering us in some different directions today as well. And then I wrote a kind of Darwinian defense of religion as an adaptive uh, cultural apparatus that in particular um, is very good at helping human beings manage their emotional lives. And so that book, Why We Need Religion, came out a couple of years ago. And finally, um, with uh, my colleague Rami Gabriel, we've written a kind of uh, an extension of affective neuroscience, uh, sort of originally hatched by our, you know, our mentor, uh, Dr. Yak Pangsep. Uh, we're, we're extending out his sort of seven systems of mammalian uh, emotion or affective systems all the way out, out into human cognition and up a ladder to human culture. So it's a very, you know, ambitious, uh, imperfect uh, project, but uh, I'm proud of that when that came out last year. Um, what I want to do today, though, is focus in on the imagination. And let's start with a brief taxonomy of imagination. Uh, the one that I think most of us know best is probably the first one, which is that imagination is art and entertainment, free playing images and narratives. If we see the work of Walt Disney or Hayao Miyazaki, uh, we see highly imaginative work. We recognize this as being part of the entertainment industry, part of the arts industry, and some people sort of see uh, that that's sort of the end of the imagination. Uh, on the other hand, if a little bit of reflection reveals that it's also very powerful in terms of moral intuition pumps. The dreaded trolley car problem is, after all, a imaginative uh, thought experiment, which is designed to try to get access to our moral intuitions and to guide and shape those intuitions. So I think the role of imagination in moral thinking doesn't quite get the uh, attention that it should. It's also extremely powerful in the scientific um, domain, and this is forgotten because we're often focused on, uh, when teaching science, for example, we teach the hypothetical deductive model, which is the formational hypothesis, the de derivation of deductions, test it, either the thing, you know, corroborates your hypothesis or it fails and you throw it out. Every good scientist knows that that's not really, it doesn't work that way, it's certainly not that simple. And the imagination has a big role to play, even in things like, um, you know, the Turing test, um, trying to figure out when would we know whether uh, AI had achieved consciousness. Religious creativity also, once you reflect on it for a moment, you can see that it's some of our oldest human culture and it's highly imaginative stuff. Uh, if you are of a particular religion, it's kind of ironic that you, you have a hard time seeing the imagination at work in your own religion, but you can readily recognize it in other people's religions. And so that's kind of a humorous, uh, ironic point. But it's really the fifth uh, sort of version of imagination, the faculty of imagination that I want to focus on in this talk. And this is the kind of um, imagination that philosophers and psychologists have been talking about for, well, for 2,000 years, over 2,000 years. And this is the idea that there's a cognitive architecture and that we can actually be thinking with images. Now, I'm going to use the word images here broadly. It's sort of in the way that Antonio Damasio uses the phrase. It can be a pictorial image that you see visually. It can be an image um, that is uh, 
sensory uh, via sound or a tactile sense. Um, I tend to sort of emphasize the, the, the visual imagery, um, but uh, I think you'll see that it, it extrapolates in most cases pretty easily. So if you look at the traditional view of imagination that somebody like Plato would have formulated, he said, well, uh, developing images and working with images is really just copying nature and then taking these derivative copies of nature and playing with them. And as a result of it, he thought it had very little to do with knowledge and very little to do with reality. Aristotle, on the other hand, said, actually, the imagination has everything to do with knowledge, and it's a kind of synthesizing faculty. It takes individual sensory experiences, uh, um, let's say different experiences with birds, um, and then it helps weave that together into uh, prototypical concepts. And then we can use these prototypical concepts to think with, to recognize other creatures as birds, to define what it is to be a bird, to rank order the birds. If I say to you, imagine a bird right now, most people living you know, in Europe or in the, you know, the United States would probably imagine something like a robin, a starling, maybe a, a, raven, a, a blackbird. Uh, but you probably wouldn't be thinking ostrich right away, and you wouldn't be thinking, you know, penguin right away. So there's a sense in which at the center of your concept of bird is probably the kind of bird that you've experienced repeatedly growing up. And then like spokes on a wheel, you will find uh, it radiating off of that, the idea of different kinds of birds. And some of them are very far from the, the radial hub. Some birds don't fly, for example. Most do. Um, then Immanuel Kant comes along and sort of restates Aristotle's view from a modern point of, point of view. And he says that, look, there's a kind of processor. He doesn't use this language, but uh, he, essentially it, it, it's what he's doing is he's saying there's a kind of processor within every human mind that has the ability to take individual uh, sensory data and weave them together with concepts. And so you marrying, you're marrying percepts and concepts. And this uh, has then, I think, been continued more recently uh, by uh, my teacher, Mark Johnson, for example, and others. I see myself in this tradition, uh, namely the embodied cognition tradition. In what way is imagination kind of embodied cognition? Well, I like to use the 5E designation rather than the 4E, and you'll see that that means that the mind is embodied, extended, embedded, inactive, and the one that's often left off is emotional. And what does this mean? It means that the mind is really using images uh, to think with. Uh, we're projecting them um, into possible futures. Um, we're ruminating on them. We're compositionally composing them, uh, analyzing and breaking them down. We're using metaphors, fairly embodied metaphors like that have to do with the positioning of our bodies and how it relates to the world to try to understand much more complicated kinds of things and experiences. Um, affect and emotion, highly embodied. There's, there's a feeling state or a somatic marker connected with I would, I would argue almost every experience that human beings have. And then affordances. Um, we are reading, uh, just like animals read the affordances of the, their environment. They can see what kind of trees are climb upable, what kinds of trees are not. Human beings are also um, seeing as. They're loaded within the perception itself is um, informational data. And all of this is to say that the imagination is a kind of pre-linguistic system of meaning. It's the activity or the functioning of the 5E. And that's, you know, that's my, that's my broad statement of the, of the theory of a kind of central operating system, the imagination. But now things get more interesting because one of the things we want to designate is that there really are uh, at least two major kinds of imagination, the voluntary and the involuntary. And um, one, I think if we were to think about this genealogically or phylogenetically, what, the, level, the sort of evolution of um, imagination, we would probably have to tell a story about involuntary images happening within the field of consciousness first, and slowly those coming under increasing executive control, such that then human beings have, involunta uh, have voluntary control over uh, the free play uh, and the direction of images. Uh, Darwin uh, talked about dreams as a kind of involuntary imagination. In The Descent of Man, he says, quote, 
The imagination is one of the highest prerogatives of man. By this faculty, he unites former images and ideas, independently of the will, and thus creates brilliant and novel results. Dreaming gives us the best notion of this power. As poet Jean Paul says, the dream is an involuntary art of poetry, end quote. That's a beautiful uh, passage in Darwin. And um, he's thinking here, of course, that this is a power that is uh, homologous or that we share with certain mammals. You, everybody has seen their dog dream or their cat dream. You, obviously, you don't see the subjective, you know, into their own minds, but you see the behavior and you see the, um, the almost hilarious uh, kind of uh, running uh, behaviors that, that you'll often find in, um, in dogs that are sleeping. Uh, what is happening in the dreaming brain? And how is it, in a sense, um, like a kind of free play of involuntary imagination? Well, one of the things we know is that there's, there are brain chemistry changes during the dreaming state and during different phases of sleep. Um, some studies show that serotonin drops. It depends on where you are in the sleep trajectory. Others, at other times, serotonin is, is spiking. Uh, but pretty clearly, we can see that the prefrontal cortex generally shuts off and the limbic system turns up. And it's interesting, in fact, that the, um, even you know, what, what Pengsep uh, called the seeking system is very active, that you've got a kind of um, almost like a foraging kind of brain is active while we're asleep. It's just that sleep atonia has shut off our bodies. And this uh, has led to recent permutation of uh, you know, brain systems for understanding uh, the imagination. Um, and that is the uh, default mode network and the task positive network or the attentional network. Um, I'm not going to get too deeply into this. I think some of you already know this literature. It's pretty exciting. There's sort of a distribution density of, you know, uh, what the default mode looks like. Um, and but there's all we're just at the beginning of this process of trying to figure out what's happening in the brain when we are uh, creative and if you think about it um, you are oftentimes engaged in a kind of task or a process let's say I'm trying to give a lecture uh, or I'm on my phone trying to get in my emails or I'm playing chess these are all largely task positive network activities. The mind is focused towards some teleological goal, uh, goal state. It's organizing means to end relations and uh, it's, uh, the attention is, is very focused. That turns out to have a specific sort of um, brain state fingerprint. Uh, the dorsal ACC is in play, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the anterior insula, the inferior parietal cortex. In contrast to that, when you stop trying to solve a task or a problem, the mind goes into a sort of default um, relaxation state. It's sort of a state of rest, and it's generally come to be called a kind of mind wandering. Um, this is, you know, when you're sort of looking out the window and daydreaming, um, and you, or you're just sitting quietly and not letting any particular task to draw your attention. And then the mind sort of reels in and ruminates on itself. I was just talking to my friend um, uh, not too long ago. We were talking about um, floating in isolation uh, tanks. And I would be curious to know if anyone has sort of uh, been able to see what's, what is your brain doing when you basically take away all perceptions and you float in an isolation tank, a sensory deprivation tank, does the mind shift into the default mode network? Uh, is it toggling back and forth? Uh, I haven't seen research on that, so maybe somebody can guide me to that. Um, all right, the, the uh, default mode network is comprised of um, a sort of uh, circuit between the anterior cingulate cortex, the posterior cingular cortex, uh, the medial temporal lobe, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex. And so you can see this happening in sort of in the fMRI studies of people doing these different kinds of tasks. Now, what's exciting is that very recent research has just started to show that the, the dreaming uh, state of brain state is really identical or very similar to a kind of intensified mind wandering, the default mode network. So when you're in REM sleep,
it's a lot like when you're engaged in a kind of quiet brainstorming or mind wandering. Uh, now this research is, is complicated in terms of trying to interpret what it means. So I remember when, when uh, the, D, the DMN first uh, started to get a lot of attention, generally it was being associated with what uh, psychologists would have called uh, a flow states. Um, and uh, the idea that there was, there was just a kind of stream of consciousness and you were, you, the self was sort of disappeared into this uh, blooming, buzzing confusion as, uh, as William James might have said. But more recently I've seen a lot of research uh, suggesting that actually the, the self um, can become a, really a central figure in um, the DMN because of this kind of autobiographical rumination. You're thinking about what you've did before, what you're going to do. It becomes very, um, uh, it's almost like episodic memory. You end up being a rather large feature of the DMN. Now, what to make of this? Um, when it first came out, the, the DMN, I thought the DMN would probably be like mindfulness because in the Buddhist state of mindfulness, one's trying to just bring the mind, you know, to, to be here now into the present moment and not sort of be focused on, you know, particular teleological tasks like solving a chess game or something. But interestingly enough, the few studies that I have seen uh, have set on, on really good meditators suggest that when the monk is meditating, and these are, you know, virtuoso meditators, uh, their mind is actually more in the TPN, the task positive network, which uh, when I, I was talking to a Zen monk about this and he actually said, well, yeah, uh, basically, of course, because it's really hard to do. It's not at all easy to keep your mind in the present moment and stop your mind from uh, wandering. So this is just a fun area that's developing sort of in real time. Something we do know f fairly clearly, though, is that um, shutting off the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which you see here in in this uh, sort of purple grayed out area. This is crucial for creating the transient hypofrontality, which, which all this means is basically you're, you're taking the break off the brain that, um, and this allows for the mind to go into a more associational and a more um, default mode type of creative uh, status. Um, at, when you um, quiet the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal, um, prefrontal cortex and the ventral medial are, are activated. This seems to be what um, it looks like when you're being imaginative and when you're being creative. There's a wonderful study by um, a neuroscientist named Charles Lim. Some of you may have seen this, uh, this work. He's been doing work on music and you can see uh, the brain uh, fMRI uh, sort of map of this brain shows the dorsolateral pr prefrontal cortex shut off and those other brain areas at the front and the sort of inside front of the brain are heavily activated. And this is when uh, a musician is actually improvising inside the fMRI machine. He built this little keyboard to keep track of it. And um, this is exciting because when he had musicians do um, written pieces, uh, either like sight reading music or uh, playing Bach from memory, then the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex was active. And it was only during this improvisational sort of uh, uh, musical style where you got the switch uh, to a different sort of, what looks like a different brain system. So, you know, human beings, particularly artists, have been trying to disengage the brain break uh, for many years. Uh, most recently, we've got the transcranial magnet interference. And if you put this on the dorsolateral prefrontal co cortex and basically compromise it, then, um, and then you ask people to solve creativity problems immediately afterwards while the, the, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is kind of confused, so to speak, they end up having, they end up being very successful at lateral thinking. It, there's something about uh, disengaging this part of the brain which takes you out of the traditional routine style of thinking and processing that you'll find in the task positive brain. And that's sort of, you know, that's what it means by, you know, when we say things like, oh, well, she's thinking outside the box. These metaphors are trying to express something like this. Now, what are the traditional techniques for disengaging the brakes? Uh, uh, you know, I, without a transcranial magnet, <laughs> we have to use other methods. And Einstein very famously said that uh, once he'd been 
exhausted by a problem that he was working on and he wasn't getting anywhere, he would just stop and set it aside and go bike riding or, or hiking and try to basically take his mind off it altogether. And the suggestion here is that there is still work, um, compositional insights, correlations, connotations, associations that are happening below the level of the conscious mind. So the argument here is that there's a kind of subconscious activity that's still happening and is putting together novel combinations of either mathematics or theories or images. And then all of a sudden, this stuff seems to emerge uh, back into the conscious mind and presents itself as a kind of solution um, or at least some fruitful direction. Um, there's a fun uh, artist who I really like named Sean Tan. He's Australian. And he was saying that uh, as, a, as a visual artist, he feels like, and he's very imaginative, he feels like he's kind of fishing in the subconscious. He's got a fishing pole and he's fishing in the subconscious. He doesn't know what he's going to pull out and out comes some, you know, this is metaphorical, out comes some idea or image that he was not really looking for, that he was not expecting. And then some of these, not all of them, but some of them end up being important and valuable for some you know, voluntary imaginative project. Uh, the creative project, in fact, the creative life could be seen as a way of just uh, increasing one's ability to fish from the subconscious. Um, uh, of course, uh, uh, the classic uh, artists like uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, Van Gogh, and so forth were drinking uh, what they called the Green Fairy, which <laughs> was absinthe, and of course now psychedelics. And so I do want to sort of guide the conversation. There'll be a little deviation here towards uh, psychedelics, both in terms of my own experience and also I think some um, philosophical sort of conceptual engineering regarding them. Um, and in order to get there, let's start with uh, cultures for disengaging the brakes. So just like there are substances for disengaging the brakes, like psilocybin, just like there are activities like going into nature for hikes and so forth, so too there are whole cultural reservoirs devoted to disengaging the brake. I'm going to mention three of them. We'll look at a couple of these just briefly because it's kind of, it's kind of helpful to understand that this is not just an individual psychological project, but also a cultural project. If you look on the left-hand side of the slide, uh, one of the great uh, <laughs> sort of unbraked uh, imaginative cultures is Hermetica, which is the magic tradition. And this is the tradition that's at least 2,000 years old. Uh, the Renaissance um, uh, philosophers and uh, historians like Ficino thought it was much older and back into the Egyptian uh, culture, but it's probably only uh, from the time period of the Neoplatonists in the Common Era, probably around the third century. In any case, the view of Hermetic um, culture is that the mind is really operating best when it's just looking for associational connections. Um, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, and they, they saw the imagination as absolutely crucial to knowledge and um, to the fulfilled, flourishing human life. The other, another sort of way of disengaging the break, of course, is ecstatic catharsis. Um, and I just recently reread Euripides the Bacchae, and it was very disturbing. I, I had read it a long time ago and forgot how disturbing it was. One of the things that, of course, we have to remember, if you take away you know, the rational task-positive mind um, and you let loose, the subconscious, maybe maybe the subcortical processing. Um, what are you going to find there? Well, it's not all uh, you know, sunshine and daisies. There's some fairly ugly stuff there. I don't care if you're a Freudian or um, uh, or or just somebody who does uh, psychoanalytic um, neuroscience, like Mark Solms at uh, at uh, in South Africa. There's some fairly ugly stuff in the uh, basement of the psyche. And here's an example of uh, Pentheus, the main character of the Bacchae, uh, being ripped to pieces by his own mother um, because they've essentially peeled, they've taken the break off in a radical way. <laughs> and it, I guess I should mention here in my own 
it's anecdotal, but in my own experiments with psychedelics, uh, I spent a lot of time in this part of the mind. Um, and one needs to remember that uh, there's a lot of uh, ugliness, aggression, uh, lust, all of the features of the id, you know, available there. And so um, that's why the, the psychedelic adventure has to be so carefully, you know, structured by in a clinical setting, I think, or at least careful. And another way of disengaging the break, of course, is the Zen tradition uh, or the Buddhist tradition generally of emptiness. What is it like when you stop solving uh, problems from the task positive point of view and you clear your mind, not just allowing the free floating imagery of, say, the hermetic tradition, uh, but actually try to cleanse the mind altogether of content. Um, so let me just say a couple of words about Hermetica and then Zen, and then we'll push on. Um, the Hermetic tradition basically sees everything as something else. And so the body is a map of the solar system and vice versa. And, you know, as above, so below. This is a view that has a lot to do with Neoplatonic metaphysics where the one is essentially emanating reality from it all the way down to us. And it's our job uh, to use the imagination to both understand the connections between things and to try to create um, new connections. So intuitive insight is prized because it's synthetic and creative. It's prized over discursive deduction, which is analytic and destructive. Imagination creates new realities and therefore it's been associated with the divine. This is sort of the divine spark within human beings. And then also one of the things I really like about hermetic uh, traditions is that the, the image remains a crucial feature of knowledge. Uh, thought pictures are ways to reach upward from the senses to the intellect. And remember, from the time of Plato, uh, then to the dismissal of graven imagery in Western religions, and then up into the scientific revolution with people like Robert Hooke, uh, who w warns us all to be careful about imagery because it's, it's so manipulative, uh, images have sort of been, you know, taking it on the chin, so to speak, or uh, sort of denigrated as compared to linguistic knowledge, propositional knowledge, and mathematics. The result is that images um, are sort of second-class citizens in, in epistemology these days. And I, I really think that um, it, it shouldn't be that way, that the image really needs to be brought back into the core of our epistemic theories. I'll just say a couple of words about this because, again, I think when I get to say a little more about the psychedelics, uh, it'll, it'll make sense. Um, of course, as many people know, uh, Zen is the Japanese version of the Chinese school Chan, which is a kind of uh, translation of jhana. Um, I put the Sanskrit spelling here, but the, the Pali is also jhana. And these are ways in which to control the mind and bring it into a state of mindfulness. In, in truth, the, 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 the sort of um, the earliest historical Buddha the Buddha of Theravada Buddhism uh, uses the word sati for mindfulness and actually uses the word jhana for a different kind of medication, uh, meditational technique, but it's all gotten rather confused in terms, of the, in terms of the retranslation. The point I want to make to you, though, is that if you can clear the mind of the task positive uh, tendency that it has, uh, you can engage in these cultural um, frames that are both uh, behavioral and psychological. So for example, mano no aware is the understanding of the, the sentimentality of things, the, um, the inevitable impermanence of all things, and therefore the great preciousness of, of all things. And the, 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 here's a quick quote on the left-hand side here from the tale of the Heike clan. Now this is the 13th century. The sound of the bells echoes the impermanence of all things. The color of the solar flowers reveals the truth that the prosperous must decline. The proud do not endure. They are like a dream on a spring night. The mighty fall at last. They are as dust before the wind. And um, I just include this to show that there's a way of training the mind so that you can appreciate um, these sort of transient qualities. Now you'll see on the right hand side of the slide the Sanskrit word sunyata and shunyata. And this is oftentimes translated as emptiness. But in Buddhism, there's three different ways of thinking about emptiness. One is the emptiness of the self. You are not a permanent substance. Uh, 
uh, but a kind of conflagration of uh, the five khandas or energy systems. And there is also the emptiness of things. Things really should not be thought of as having an essence, um, certainly not having permanence, and instead um, th all things are basically just nodes in a sort of web of dependent arising, or what's called patichu samapada. And finally, the mind itself can be emptied through this process. And this is called bhavanga, or mental cultivation, or prabhasvara chitta, which is a sort of cleansing of the content of mind. And this, I think, is an exciting uh, point because you're going to see that even though this is not imagination as we ordinarily think of it, it is a radical way of taking the brain break and, uh, off. Uh, it's sort of interesting to contrast uh, the Zen tradition of emptiness with the Tibetan tradition or the Bhutanese tradition, which is highly imaginative and uses the imagination as a kind of um, uh, creative visualization and meditation. All right, so let's turn then to psychedelic investigation, uh, finding cognitive universals, question mark. This is, um, I'm going to do a bit of a, a sort of a, uh, a pause or a hover here on some interesting questions uh, about, you know, what is innate in the mind and what is the result of experience. And uh, this probably has little benefit for the clinician, but it might, I, I don't know, uh, that, that not being my, my area. Um, okay, let's look at these three areas. Uh, one, we want to know, is there imaginative and ideational content? If you take ayahuasca or psilocybin, in my case I did a fair amount of LSD when I was in college, um, the interesting question is, does one there discover uh, narrative universals where everyone ultimately could see below the kind of cultural accretions some kind of narrative universal that everyone would, would agree to. And of course, you know, some um, sort of Jungian archetypes uh, are basically attempts to, to, um, to clarify or to, to assert such a discovery. Um, are there image universals? Not just, uh, you know, if you think about mythopoiesis, it's not just linguistic uh, stories, it's also images. So do people, in fact, see similar imagery? And this can be something g rather generic. Like, I know there's some interesting research showing that many people who take ayahuasca will have a some common imagery where they can see themselves being fractured into parts and then recomposed. Now, uh, I don't know, but that's the th sort of thing I'm driving at here. Some people who are, you know, devotees of alchemy will say that the actual images of alchemy will emerge. Here I'm going to ar argue that I'm a bit, bit uh, skeptical or dubious on that front. Are there conceptual universals that one finds during these altered states? Two is a category that's quite different, although these are all interrelated with each other. So two is basically what about cognitive architecture? Not the content of an image or a story, but what about the affective universals? Does one find during these sort of phenomenological investigations of inner you know, consciousness, does one find a fairly stable set of emotional you know, experiences? Does one actually encounter the sort of common perceptual um, universals that, that all of us have? And three, are there uh, cognitive pathways? Uh, and here, I think this is the kind of work that one can't do phenomenologically, um, but uh, can, can be done through brain imaging techniques and so forth. And that's the, the question is, in some of these states, um, do you find uh, cortical cerebellar subcortical circuits you know, that are reliable and you know, robust? Is there a specific task positive to default mode network sort of um, toggling. For example, uh, one study I, I read sh was showing that um, when, when people are performing music, there's an interesting sort of relationship between uh, the DMN, the default mode network, and actually the, I think it's the dorsal ACC, anterior cingulate cortex. And that's weird because you're actually mixing between the two systems that are supposed to be, you know, f almost like phase shifts. Uh, the ventral tegmental area, how is that working? So these are all interesting questions about cognitive universals. Now, if you look at the quote below by Andrew Jones, this is sort of helpful. 
he points out there are two broad views in current psychedelics research. According to mind manifesting views, psychedelics are therapeutically valuable because they facilitate access to unconscious material. Alternatively, according to mind modifying views, psychedelics produce benefit by disrupting rigid thought patterns and increasing psychological flexibility. However, these views are sometimes conflated in current research. And I think this is a very important point. Um, and we'll come back to this momentarily. All right, I want to ask uh, really about the content of this kind of primordial mind. Um, and let's uh, basically take a moment here with Carl Jung. I don't know what degree of, you know, uh, folks are still devoted Jungians. Um, and it's also a little bit up for debate as to how we should understand the notions of archetypes. But let's take a look at uh, the general thesis that, that can be, I think, sustained. Uh, here uh, is just a quote from Psychology and Alchemy by Jung in which he said, and I, I use this one because we just looked at the hermetic tradition of alchemy and magic. And Jung says, quote, I am therefore inclined to assume that the real root of alchemy is to be sought less in philosophical doctrines than in the projections of individual investigators. I mean by this that while working on his chemical experiments, the operator had certain psychic experiences which appeared to him as the particular behavior of the chemical process. Since it was a question of projection, he was naturally unconscious of the fact that the experience had nothing to do with matter itself, that is, with matter as we know it today. He experienced his projection as a property of matter, but what he was in reality experiencing was his own unconsciousness, um, his own unconscious. In this way, he recapitulated the whole history of mankind's knowledge uh, or of nature. Such projections repeat themselves whenever man tries to explore the empty, an empty darkness and involuntarily fills it with living form. So Jung had a notion of primordial images, and there's a, there's a list that would include things like the shadow, the anima, animus, the mother, the trickster, the hero. I have no particular um, uh, conviction on this or horse in this race, but I'm just trying to show you what I think some of the problems might be. If you think that there is some kind of genetic memory, you, th you have to wrestle with what I'm calling the content problem. And the problem is basically this, A, there is no inheritance of acquire, acquired traits. And I say this fully aware that uh, epigenetics is now uh, presenting us with some very interesting facts about the ability of an organism to pass down things like metabolic rate processing, like tendencies towards obesity and so forth. Um, there's even been some studies of mice that suggest that fear of like uh, a certain smell can be passed down to um, further generations. So the jury's out on that, but at least it's something that has to be articulated and cleared up. Um, B, now there's no evidence of innate content. Uh, and here there is some evidence of innate content, but it's not uh, like images. It's not like you're gonna, every human being is gonna have a trip and see, you know, the raven attacking a dog or something. Uh, instead, what we know from baby lab experiments like th that of Elizabeth Spelke, and I suppose uh, Paul Bloom maybe, um, is that babies have a kind of native folk physics about perception and prediction, uh, not concepts or forms or content. Um, in other words, like if you put a, baby on a, on a ledge, <laughs> this sounds worse than it is, you put it on a, a ledge here and you put a piece of glass across it, will the, the crawling baby cross the glass or will they stop themselves? And universally they sort of stop themselves because they seem to understand right away that there's some danger there. Uh, I don't think my son would have stopped actually uh, going over the ledge, but uh, in any case, that's what the data shows. So in summary then, there's no compelling evidence for genetic memory. So the idea that psychedelics and certain techniques that we've been describ describing here in the culture of, uh, of, of removing the break of transient hypofrontality do not really uh, seem to deliver up much in terms of genetic memory. However, um, I do think that uh, much of what's been attributed to phylogeny is in fact discoverable in ontogeny. Uh, 
the development of the child, uh, the, the child's mind. And so it's pretty clear um, that human beings are extremely good at social learning. And we know now there's a lot of empirical evidence that human beings really, yeah, from a very early age, they really attend to what another human being is doing, particularly their parents at the early age. They absorb this information and they're able to basically mimic it and simulate it. So simulation, mimicry, and conditioning, humans are great at that. And then if you add certain kinds of images, sticky memes, uh, viral imagery, then human beings could end up you know, by the time they're seven or eight or 10, they've got a whole lot of stuff that seems innate and preloaded, like fear of snakes and spiders and notions of particular kinds of monsters. Um, and all of this can appear to be genetic memory and all of it can appear to be innate, but in fact is the result of these social learning and conditioning um, abilities that human beings have. There is another tradition here that I really like a lot on the right-hand side, the affective systems and story templates. One of the things that might we might discover, and it looks compelling to me at this point, is that perhaps um, the imaginative stories that cultures tell, which really reduce down to, you know, you can count them on, on one, one hand, maybe two, uh, in terms of sort of the genres of story, um, maybe these are not connected to specific ideas or images um, or genetic memory. Maybe they're just the result of having a handful of affective or emotional systems that we're all hardwired with. Uh, these, are, um, these are hardwired in terms of their ability to, to run away and provoke behavior, but they're soft wiring because they're able to take in data. For example, fear is the same um, sort of neurochemically and behaviorally in a rat and a human, but um, the system is so is is flexible enough that humans are basically afraid of the dark and rats are afraid of light. So th you have a innate system that can then grasp onto unique um, conditioning experiences within the environment. Now, what P Patrick Hogan has argued, and I, I really like this. He says, the, the, if you look at the ro typical romantic plot which is found all over the world, it's a narrative expression of the lust system you know, described by somebody like pa Yak Panksepp. Um, the typical horror plot is a narrative expression of the fear system. Tragedies are expressions of the grief system, which is a separation distress system. And mysteries and hero stories an act of the seeking system, or what Kent, Kent Barrage at University of Michigan would call the wanting system. And this is connected in many ways to addiction as well. So these are exciting ways in which the imagination could be a kind of core operating system that is flexible enough to take in uh, information and data, but also has innate or native uh, tendencies. So uh, this has gotten me to look a lot at universal grammars of, of imagination. Uh, we're familiar with the idea that, that language may have a deep grammar from the time of, of uh, you know, Chomsky down to the present, there's, a, there's clearly a, a set of scholars devoted to the idea of a gen, deep generative grammar. I want to submit that the same is true of images. And I was looking at images and you find all over the world and all through history that hybridizing is a fairly common way in which we f create these sticky memes that then cultures um, sort of coalesce around. So for example, Ganesh is part um, elephant head and human. Um, the sphinx is part human and cat. Uh, the lower left hand image is an image of uh, uh, Enkidu and uh, Gilgamesh killing Humbaba, which is a which is a cognate, which is a hybrid creature of different animals. And then there in the lower right hand corner is the lion man um, at, from a German cave. Uh, I think this is maybe 35, 40,000 years old. And so the, what you see then is in order to get a good hybrid, you can do one of these four things I'm suggesting. You can multiply parts, you can blend taxonomic categories, you can do domain crossing, and uh, you can blend metaphysical categories. Um, for example, like zombies are, are sort, of mix, sort of mixtures of the living and the dead, you know, the undead. And so my provisional conclusion then is that universals of cognitive architecture that we were referring to earlier um, and you know, universals of cognitive processing, 
those produce the seemingly universal images, ideas, and content. And there's a lot of evidence that this is true because most cultures, for example, have something like a werewolf. Um, but in fact, uh, those, the werewolf is common in Europe. Um, the, uh, in Nat among Nat Native Americans in the Americas, it's a werebear. In Indonesia and in Africa, you have were crocodiles. Uh, so my point is that I think what we're finding as universal images are in fact produced by this cognitive architecture and processing, and then the inputs are from the local environment. Now, um, a sort of interesting sort of side point here to make, uh, to connect back with what we were saying about um, uh, the Zen tradition of hypofrontal transient hypofrontality. Uh, what I want to say here is my argument so far suggests uh, that we will look in vain for specific innate image content in the mind manifesting and the mind modifying uses of psychedelics. The specific symbology of alchemy, for example, is unlikely to be found within unless you've already put it there. And that, that is actually an interesting point too. But Zen culture, meditation, and psychedelic experiences do seem to produce universals, in part because they empty content altogether. So what you're doing in the course of mindful meditation um, or trying to clear the mind is not trying to get at content, but trying to get rid of content. And that, the resulting experience, might indeed be one of the most universal experiences that people, you know, um, using psychedelics and other forms of ecstatic um, intervention will we'll discover. And so here I, I, I say here in the second paragraph, in the religious imagination, conceptual thinking drives theology and makes possible a more systematic representation of universals. Before these modes of representation, however, lies what Piaget and Inhelder called the a-dualism of the child, the state of consciousness before an integrated self. The distinction or boundary between self and world is not an early datum for the infant, it emerges slowly through experience. And Robert Bellis says, calls this the unitive experience and suggests that it precedes the more content-rich representational modes serving as a crucial touchstone for later religious thought. Um, because what we're talking about is basically the experience of transcendence. Bellis says, quote, the unitive event then is a kind of ground zero with respect to uh, religious representations. It transcends them, yet it requires them if it is to be communicable at all. Christian negative theology and the Buddhist teaching of emptiness, uh, shunyata, attempt to express this paradoxically by speaking of nothingness, the void, silence, or emptiness. And uh, I just find this kind of exciting because it, it shows me that there is an interesting connection between the religious imagination, in particular Buddhist meditation, um, and the psychedelic kinds of investigations that are happening. Well, let's ask ourselves the um, adaptive question uh, about fitness. If imagination is an illusion maker or a counterfactual generator, uh, why do we have it? Well, hopefully I've already established that the imagination is much more than that. Uh, that's generally how the problem was characterized in the 1990s. Uh, you may recall that Steven Pinker famously said, you know, the imagination is really, I think he made this comment about music uh, in specific, but the imagination generally, he said it was a kind of cognitive cheesecake. Uh, it's what you get as an evolutionary byproduct of having a really good problem-solving brain. Uh, that's the adaptation, and then imagination sort of comes along for the ride. Um, the alternative view, and it's one that I um, basically hold to is that no, the imagination itself is an evolutionary adaptation. In what sense is it an adaptation? Well, the mind is an adaptive prediction processor. And this is kind of um, an, an idea that comes out of Kant. It's there sort of nascent in, in Kant's ideas. He's not thinking sort of evolutionarily. Uh, but then Andy Clark gives full expression to it in the last uh, five, maybe ten years. Uh, our experience is not a passive mirror of nature, but rather our mind-brain uses internal concepts, models, and imaginative constructions, i.e. fantasia, to predict immediate and distant events. The mind-brain uses prior experience, priors, as a template against which errors or novelties jump out. Now, Andy Clark, 
is not really talking much about the imagination. I've sort of imported that in here because I think that my view of the imagination will dovetail nicely with predictive processing theories. I will call your attention on the right hand side to some deviations in my view. One is uh, imagination is a 5E processor of, of templates, pictorial, dramatic, mythopoetic, generally speaking. And they do basically these two things, uh, A, making sense of experience, what is the case, and B, making future, uh, what can be the case. And uh, the difference between my view and other prediction processor views of mind is that I, I think the priors um, and predictions are analog. They're basically images and affective somatic markers, not Bayesian calculations uh, that are capable of digital modeling. Now, I'm still working on this and haven't worked it out entirely, but that's just a way to distinguish what I'm up to here, but also show connection to predictive processing theories. All right, um, my view really is that there's a kind of mythopoetic cognition that I've been describing here throughout this talk, and the way to maybe uh, condense it uh, into its clearest articulation is to talk about it as the expression of the imperative mind. After World War II, archaeologists Henri and Henrietta Frankfurt proposed the theory that pre-axial age mind was mythopoetic. Uh, a mythopoetic paradigm or perspective sees the world primarily as dramatic, a dramatic story of competing personal intentions rather than a system of objective impersonal laws. So the river can be mad at you. The weather can be pleased with your sacrifice. Uh, the trees can be your friends, uh, and so on. And so according to this view, nature is not an it, but a thou. Uh, the Frankfurts were trying to take Martin Buber's distinction of I, of it and thou, and apply it more generally. You know, instead of like between you and another person who you have to treat respectfully as an agent, the, the, what they're arguing is that early mythopoetic cognition thinks of all of nature in this way, that, um, that there's a kind of uh, drama uh, unfolding within nature. It's not just a machine. And in the lower left-hand corner of the slide, some of the most fundamental mythopoetic templates are agency attribution. So you think of trees and clouds as having, having agency. Teleological thinking is very common. You think of things as for other things. This tree is for the sake of this bird. Um, this animal is for the sake of my nutrition. And uh, affective entanglement, um, affiliative or adversarial entanglement with other subjects. In other words, drama. We, a mythopoetic way of seeing the world is drama first. Um, the world is made up of enemies and friends and loved ones and um, strangers, and the other ways of thinking about um, human social life uh, come after that primordial drama. Now, you might think, well, religion's a good place to look at this, and it certainly is, but I would suggest that animism, a kind of you know, proto-religion, is an even better place to look. And so I've, doing, I've been doing a lot of work on this lately, and I'm gonna have some things coming out uh, shortly on this. Um, but animism is basically the idea that there are many kinds of persons, only some of whom are humans. And that's sort of the best way of, of stating it without loading it with all kinds of sort of uh, dismissive anthropological perspective. It's very common then for animism uh, to be treated among the sort of dismissive an anthropologists as like the early phase of proto-science, but we overcame it in fact, this is what Tyler says, this is what Freud says, Hume, I think Hume says this, that we overcame uh, animism with monotheism and then we overcame monotheism with secular humanism. I sort of reject this tra trajectory and it's my view that you and I, uh, no matter where you fit on this so-called uh, hierarchy or chain, are still, uh, still engage in animistic thinking fairly regular. Um, uh, and so what are the properties then of animistic thinking? And why would they be selected for? Why would they be adaptive? I want to suggest four possible uh, ways in which animistic thinking or mythopoetic thinking is adaptive. One, it produces a lot of what's now called traditional ecological knowledge. There's a lot of good research coming out on this now that pe indigenous peoples who characterize the world as a kind of drama of uh, competing and affiliative agents know fairly deep 
um, interconnections between species and um, ecologists and biologists are now regularly appealing to indigenous people uh, for insight and wisdom about some deep connections that they can't see using a kind of mechanical view of nature. Uh, I do think animism is very good at improving social intelligence. Um, I don't quite have time to sketch this um, in detail, but thinking of the world as made up of agents who you must then satisfy and appease um, is very challenging and it basically increases your social muscles. Uh, I lived in Cambodia for a while and traveled in Laos and Vietnam and Burma. Um, and the animism there is very much about um, sort of appeasing the spirits which are all around you. And um, it's very interesting, you have to get up every day and make certain kinds of sacrifices and prayers. And all of this makes one uh, think a lot about the uh, goals, agendas, and intentional states of other agents. And this is very good for social intelligence generally, when you, when you just take it back to human beings even. I do think that imaginative thinking uh, in animism and elsewhere is highly therapeutic, which I'm gonna explain in a moment. And it's very good at threat rehearsal, trying to get ready for threats by engaging in these kinds of um, dramatic um, uh, rehearsals. All right, so let me, in the couple of minutes remaining, let me just mention some lines of evidence for, for all of this. One is there's some really wonderful evidence coming out now about threat rehearsal. Um, some friends uh, and colleagues of mine, uh, Colt Scrivener and Matthias Claussen, uh, just are publishing this piece. It got a lot of attention in the last few months uh, about the pandemic practice. Horror fans and morbidly curious individuals are more psychologically resilient during the COVID-19 pandemic. What they found was that overwhelmingly, um, they, did, they basically did a, whole, a survey analysis of a lot of participants. People who have a, a taste for you know, horror films, zombie apocalypses, uh, survival prepper films, Turns out that in general, uh, those people are doing better in lockdown situations during COVID-19 uh, by other metrics. Um, they report being happier, healthier, um, less depressed and so forth. So there's interesting uh, sort of data coming in to confirm uh, the Canadian cognitive psychologist Keith Oatley's uh, claim that fiction is the mind's flight simulator in a way. And there's even some data that suggests that uh, readers of fiction score better in understanding the social world. Uh, all right, two more quick points. Uh, evidence two, monster imagery and processing trauma. I just tried to choose like one example of this sort of in the clinical uh, setting. And here I'm drawing on the work of Hamilton. Uh, this just came out. Um, Many trauma victims experience involuntary emergence of specific monster imagery during triggered episodes. These monsters intrude into consciousness, waking and dreaming, and act as both a phenomenologically th uh, threatening presence and symbolic of the earlier trauma. So oftentimes the person understands them in both these ways simultaneously. Carefully facilitating therapeutic uh, revisiting of such imagery scenarios is effective sense-making activity and helps patients process otherwise abject terrors. For example, using storytelling and even films, therapists can play, place the trauma monster into a teleological narrative that has a resolution. You can defeat the monster, repudiation, acceptance, transformation, and so on. So uh, there at the bottom, facing and defeating monsters in fiction may be analogous of the process of overcoming trauma within therapy, which often necessitates a level of re-exposure to trauma, experience for integration uh, of the experience to occur. And lastly, here's where I'll, I'll bring the discussion to a close, uh, or the, the presentation to a close. And that is, um, I, I offer you one more piece of evidence of the adaptive power of the imagination. And it's from a musician, Nick Cave. Uh, he very tragically lost his son. His son fell off of a cliff and died as a result of his head injuries. Um, that happened several years ago, and Nick Cave fell into a deep depression and uh, really could not function, really. Now, he, Nick Cave runs a uh, website where he actually answers questions from his fans, and uh, he's very honest and generous with his uh, time there. And I recently came across this. Um, someone else had lost a loved one and was appealing to Nick Cave to, for some kind of help to try to process it and, and make sense of it. 
And he, I, this is a long quote, but it really, I promise you, it's worth it. Uh, we'll end on this. Here's what Nick Cave says. He says, my well-meaning and desperately worried friends would speak uh, into my grief using words that made no sense. They would tell me that my son lived in my heart, for example. But when I searched my heart, I found nothing but chaos and despair. One desperate morning, however, I did the most simple of things, and perhaps this can help you with the loss of your wife and your brother. I sat by myself in a quiet space and called upon my son by name. I closed my eyes and imagined lifting him from my heart, this tormented place in which I was told he lived, and I positioned him outside of my body, next to me. Beside me, I said, you are my son, and now you are beside me. These few words had a powerful vibrational effect, and this simple act of imagination was the first step in a process that would eventually lead me back to the world. By performing this act, I was temporarily released from the, relational, from the rational world, a merciless place that gave me no peace and given access to an impossible realm where I could form an increasingly resolute relationship with the spiritual idea of my lost child. I began to feel Arthur's presence. I talked to him. He talked to me. I took him with me wherever I went. I toured Europe and America uh, with the In Conversation show, and he sat with me in my dressing room or later at night in my hotel, or he escorted me onto the stage and stood there beside me. I felt emboldened by his constructed presence, or perhaps true presence, who knows? What did it matter? I felt increasingly empowered, unafraid, uh, as I allowed him to accompany me out of my boundless grief. Sometimes on stage I would look out at the audience and feel a collective spiritual influence attending to everyone. It was a deeply powerful experience and testament to the restorative force of our imaginings. That child of God, that divine invention, rescuing me from my catastrophic heart and in doing so freeing himself from the convulsion of my grief. And so that's just a good place to uh, draw to a close uh, and I, hopefully you've been able to see both sort of a theory of the imagination as an operating system and also why it may well be, uh, have, have been selected for uh, over evolutionary time and why it may be conserved. All right, thank you.